So growing up in Wapaka, Wisconsin, there was always this idea, in my life anyway, that success meant getting getting out of that town, right? Town of 5,000 people. There's a foundry. There's you know your basic economy there. And my parents, even though they had made their whole lives there and, and never lived further than a mile away from their parents, either of them actually. Um, wow, that's, that's crazy, right? Um, the idea that they taught me and my brother, my brother and I, were was to get out of the town to be successful. Kind of a vague goal, isn't it? Just leave the town and you'll be successful. But for me, it was this idea of basketball in college. And here we are in senior, just before senior year, the summer, summer before senior year. I still had nothing buttoned down, but but you know my I still felt that I would probably find, I think I might have had a couple of recruiting letters and things, and I felt that I would probably end up going to college, probably not on a full scholarship. So it was I wasn't giving it, Enough. I didn't really understand what I was getting into, but anyway, comes along a foreign exchange student from Slovakia, and her name was Eva. And I remember the day we met, it was at the park by the lake, and we were sitting under a tree with just a couple friends, and she was so beautiful, just completely glowing in the sunlight. And I remember um, noticing that she had shorts on. It was the summer. It was August. And she her, she didn't shave her legs, just being, being European back in 1992. And she had this nice little fuzzy peach hair on her legs. And I was like, oh, I kind of don't mind. And I was like, wow, I don't mind. And she didn't use deodorant. And you could kind of smell an actual odor of a person. But I didn't mind. It was just exotic to me. It was, the whole thing was so exotic. Um and I fell in love. I just fell in love. Like, I, I mean, obviously, I've been with the same girls, you know, a small class of a couple hundred people. You kind of know everybody, everyone already. So I was just completely crazy for this girl. I never thought, like, well, what are, what are we going to do if we fall in love or something? I just wanted to be with her. And I called the house where the family she was staying at, the host family, and, and he was a state state trooper, police officer, <laughs> So it wasn't the easiest situation. And, you know, call and ask for for Eve. And at this point, she could she could not even speak English. I mean, she could barely speak English. Senior year in high school, coming to America for a year. And I remember I couldn't really talk to her on the phone. She kind of just giggled and tries to use some kind of a sexy voice. And I was like, I'm not even sure if she knew who I was, uh, which, one of, which one of those guys I was at that, at that point. And... Something else happened. There was a dance. So there used to be this place called the casino. It wasn't a casino. It was a dance hall on the chain of lakes. And kind of like the feeling of an old big barn, which was awesome. And in the summer, I think it was every Wednesday night, they would have team dances. No alcohol. And people actually showed up. It was, it was awesome. It was a wonderful time. I looked forward to it so much. My mom, before I had a driver's license, I guess freshman and sophomore year, she would actually come pick me up at like midnight, which was like a 15, 20 minute drive from, from where we lived. And anyway, so at this point I'm driving, but sure enough, <clears throat> Eva comes to the dance and she was dressed uh, with a, like a sailor, like sailor uh, hat and, and the, those kinds of blue and white colors, just beautiful, nice body. And she knew how to dance. She really knew how to dance. And before the dance, there was karaoke, and of course, I had to show off. I had to get her attention, right? And I got up on stage and 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 did uh, Bust a Move by Young, Young MC, <laughs> and it was, I, it was, I was into that kind of early 90s hip-hop and kind of knew it hard, you know, knew it by heart, and they played it back, and they were like, yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty much, I said, no, that's the original recording. They said, no, that was you. <laughs> so I guess I must have been good enough to impress. Kidding. Um, embarrassing, but I guess kind of, I don't know. I, I guess I would do it again if I had to do it over again. And the funny thing is, somehow she had met my brother also. Uh, and it's, she's only been in the town for like five days. And she she met my brother and was talking to him. And she's like, and she, and I was like, you're, I was like, how do you know each other? Uh, and then he just kind of, I guess he liked her too, but, but I, I kind of made my move so strongly that 
I guess she just immediately knew she had to choose one of us. And my younger brother, and I think she kind of liked him too, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> um, it's funny. And, um, okay, so school starts, and I'm just like completely enamored with her, calling her every day, every other day, I don't know. And one of the first dates we had, I had, you know, driving around and doing our our Dairy Queen Hardy's things or whatever whatever we did. I think she liked Dairy Queen a lot. She loved American food. Um, she came in perfect shape and by and by winter she had gained quite a bit of weight actually because of American food and how much she you know, she didn't really understand nutrition and just ate whatever she liked. And and oh one one more funny story. We went to a baseball game, um, I guess early September probably or late late summer, I don't know. And she just, you know, she couldn't understand English. It was like, she said, if you go to Europe, I was like, yeah. She's like, you go? I said, I said if I go to Europe, then what? If you go to Europe. <laughs> and it went down like this for like a few minutes. And and finally, and, she, and I'm like, she's like, you teach me English. You teach me English. Well, she wanted help with her homework. So she, of course she was interested in me teaching her English, of course. But finally, I realized later, oh, you were asking if I've been to Europe. No, I've not been to Europe. Um, so that's the level of her English. And probably that made it easier to fall in love. I found over the years that, that language gets in the way of, of, of understanding. Because with language of two people in the same culture or two you know, fluent speaking people of the same language you kind of pick words like i can't believe you used that word i can't believe you said that all these subtleties can get in the way of true communication or love and in the case of me and eva it was just from the very beginning she was not looking for love um but but i just completely won her over i was such a gentleman i was um giving her gifts and asking my mom what how i can how i can impress her and just being this this great guy and of course, our plan was to split up and, and life goes on at the end of senior year. But, you know, when you fall in love and you start kissing by the dashboard lights and, and when when you have have sex for the first time and it feels like it's with a real woman, it's like, this, this is a real woman I have. This is not a little girl, um, you know, that I'm, that I'm with. And I, it just became this thing, Chad and Eva, and... So basketball season starts, and of course she's my number one fan. She's out there in, in the bleachers and following me, and and I'm picking her up for our dates from her host family, and and we just have this just perfect deep connection of total attraction, and and actually really amazing love, amazing. And I think it was whenever I guess in Wisconsin or probably anywhere, but in Wisconsin especially when. Winter comes around. It's just this long, depressing thing, especially if you're in, on the basketball team and you're out there late, you know, after practice, and it just gets so depressing. You get so tired and run down. And at some point, I think that I that I knew that it, it was just, what, what are we going to do? Are we going to date? It was like it was around Christmas or, or like January. Like, what are we going to do? Are we going to date? Like, are we going to marry each other? Or like, am I going to move to Europe? Is she going to live in the, in the U.S.? What are we supposed to do? Date four more months, and then break up? It started to not make sense, and so I, I broke up with her. I didn't, I didn't really tell her why. I just cut it off. And a couple days went by, and both of us were just in deep pain. And I thought I was doing the right thing, but um, I, I clearly, I wasn't ready to break up with her. And, and I remember the day. One one night I had this dream that we were back together. It was maybe three or four days into this, and I had a dream that we were back together, and I, I was so happy. I was so happy in that dream. It was just an absolute wonderful dream. Driving along in the car, the sunshine, and, and everything was good. And the next day, I come to school, and she says, um, "We need to talk." I was find an cl empty classroom. I was like, "Okay." We walked into the classroom, and I said, "I want you back." <laughs> She's like, "What?" So we got back together and not too much longer after that, I realized like, well, we're back together. Let's, let's talk about marriage. 
crazy. I was I was 18. She was 17 still. And she was supposed to go back home in June. And we started talking about just being together and getting married and how that would even work. And my mom helped. I told her that I'm in love with her and I want to marry her. And my mom helped um, do some research as to how you can apply for a visa to get her back and, you know, go through the process. Um, so I proposed to her at, at night on the top of a, we called it Kmart Hill. It was, it was kind of the man-made hill behind Kmart when they dug out the hill for Kmart. And that was my romantic move to go to Kmart Hill and, and propose and um, took her around to the to the football stadium where we had first had our first date um, and tried to make it like, you know, memories and, and romantic. And so we were engaged, had a ring and everything else. And of course, she didn't tell her parents yet. Um and this is going to be a lot of Eva, but I'll, I will diverge from this at some point. But I'm going to just get through this, you know, kind of the story of, of how we came to be together. Um, so, you know, we have plans, but of course it kind of feels like it's not it's not certain until we're together, right? Um, now, this t- at this time, I had gotten an offer to come to Colorado Springs, to the, to the University of Colorado at Colorado Springs, to play basketball there, uh, Division Two and expensive. I had to pay out-of-state tuition to go there, and at least for the first year, and then we could we could go to in-state tuition. I had some kind of small scholarship, a couple thousand a year toward my tuition, um, and I only had $10,000 in savings. And of course, she had very little. She was from a communist country. Now, her, Eva's dad is a dentist. Eva's mom is a physician. So even though they didn't have much money at the time, there was this class issue between us that she was upper class, you know, champagne drinking, um, social, having manners, using a knife and a fork, whereas I just used the fork. Um, and, I, and, you know, so there was that. that We didn't really know there was much of a problem there yet. We were in high school. Um, but so what happened is she went back. Long story short, this is I know it sounds like a long story, but actually this is the short version. <laughs> she went back first. And I had, I think it was like, Two weeks or six? No, six weeks. I had six weeks <laughs> before I was supposed to come to fly to Prague to obviously leave, leave, fly by myself the first. No, I flew to Colorado, but to fly out of the country for the first time. Got a passport. Got my documentation to bring her back um, with a, with a visa, a visitor's visa, and um, you know, so she's she's. And back then, of course, no internet, so communication was almost impossible. It was so expensive to call, just literally ridiculously expensive to call. Uh, but I did call a few times, and she was a little bit weird on the phone, a little bit like she's doubting, like she's kind of laughing at me, kind of an attitude. And I, I, I kind of felt that maybe it wasn't a sure thing. And here I am, supposed to fly there. And then and then from there, the plan was that we were going to uh, drive drive to Colorado Springs and, and move in together. And, you know, so I had apartment chosen. I had a, everything ready to go that when, when I got back in late July, early August from this trip, this three-week trip, that she'd be with me. That was the plan. And we would spend a day or two in Wisconsin and, and then drive to Colorado and move. And when I when I got to, to Prague, um... She had some. She met me at the Prague airport, and we had a, like a fifteen-hour journey by car with some some friends. I think it was um, to get back. It was a really grueling trip. And when I got to her town, her I met her parents, and you know they they I guess they were kind of obviously upset about the whole situation. How does their daughter come home and say I'm marrying this American? Okay, is he rich? No, he's not rich. Okay, he's gonna play basketball. Okay. Uh, we don't have money. He doesn't have much money. You guys are going to go off and pay tuition. And, and, and by the way, she wasn't going to go to school the first year. <laughs> so she was on track to be a doctor like her parents. That was the plan. And she comes back and says, well, I'll babysit the first year, make some money. And then second year, I'll go to school. So there was absolutely no, um, nothing certain about the future. And her parents, I think, tried to totally refuse it. But eventually they, they said, look, they probably thought it was a long shot. They probably thought we were silly kids. And they said... If it's meant to be, okay, we'll take you to the embassy. We'll take a long trip across Slovakia at some point during this trip. And if you get the visa approved, 
then, and that's where she had to apply for the visa and the embassy and, and with the paperwork and the letters and everything else as a tourist visa. Um, because we knew if we went for the, for the marriage visa, that's probably more of a long shot. And I, so I just want to get her back in the country and then get married. Right. And, um, so I remember we, we, we got all the way, I mean, you can't imagine how nervous we were just totally silly kids in love trying to be together forever. Like it felt like if we could just be together forever, then we'd be happy. Then everything would be great. Like that's all that needed to happen in life. If we could just sleep together. Uh, and have our own apartment together that, of course, we'll be happy forever. And that's how it feels when you're young and in love. And so, of course, she goes into the embassy. And I think her dad went with her. Her mom didn't go with her. Her mom sat in the car with me. And we had no shared language. And we just sat there and smiled at each other for, you know, a half hour. And she comes out and she got she got the visa. <laughs> so we, you know, long story short, I, I, I loved coming to Slovakia. Um, I absolutely loved it. It was the most amazing trip, first of all. I mean, to, to be part of a, of a family with traditions. They would sing together. They would go to a cottage by the lake together. They would drink slivovica and, and, and beer and, and champagne and, you know, cook all day and swim. And it was just all these relatives, aunts and uncles and cousins, young people around, mid, middle-aged people around. Her grandpa was amazing. He would just stand in the middle of the room and start singing a song, to the, and the family would just be quiet and listen and, and applaud at the end. It was just, as an American, I just had never even heard of such a thing. It was like I was in a movie. I fell in love with Slovakia. And, yeah, it was just amazing. And they treated me so well, like royalty. I, felt, I just felt so special. And, 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 of course, it was interesting. In 1993... You know, four years after the end of so of communism here, um, to have to have an American here, um, everybody was very nice to me, and, and and it was just a wonderful, wonderful experience in a beautiful country with the mountains and and the nature and the beautiful old um, you know cities, <coughs> towns, and so long story short, we we get back to Wisconsin, just sleep there for I think two nights, and we we go off and drive through. North Dakota and down to Colorado. And my parents were following with a U-Haul. We had the car in the U-Haul. And um, we had an old apartment in Colorado Springs. Green, old, you know, kitchen, kind of depressing. Obviously out of date by 20 or 30 years. And um, not very much money. No job yet. And I remember how difficult that time was. I mean, to, the, the awakening from the dream of being together to the reality of being together on your own at age 18 for two people, it was too much. It was too, it was, you know, you're thrown into the fire immediately. And when my parents said goodbye, um, the night that it was like, okay, that's the end of our childhood. We had no, no more mom and dad there, not hers nor mine. And, we closed the door and we were just crying. And, I, and I, I fell into tears. I was by the door and I put my back against the door and I slid down the door and sat on the floor right by, and leaned against the door, crying my eyes out, bawling, that I was so scared. Now that obviously terrified her because she needed a man at that moment, right? <laughs> I mean, can you imagine? And what did she do? Did she handle it well? Nah. She kicked me. She fucking abused me. She kicked me. She hit really hard multiple times. She started beating up on me. And I should have mentioned when we were in Slovakia, one of the interesting things is that um, she was not nice to me. <laughs> she was sarcastic and she was always like rolling her eyes and being and yelling at me. And her, even her mom and dad was scolding her for how she was treating me. It should have been kind of a red flag, I guess. But I was blind. I just wanted to be with her. So a lot of this now, this the first year of marriage was just absolutely very, very difficult. And I suppose it would be for anybody in that situation. Um, I had a job like two days a week cleaning at the university, which paid almost nothing. So the, the money's running down right away. And she got a job as a babysitter, but it wasn't, it wasn't enough money to pay for my, my university and books and everything else and the apartment and, you know, and if the car broke, the car would break down because it was, um, 
icy and hilly over there and I hit a curb and I thought, well, I'll just call my mom and dad and say the car broke down and I need, I need more money. And I called and my parents said, no, you're on your own. And that, that was a big moment in my life also. And I would suggest anybody as a parent to make your kid feel that they actually are on their own early in life, maybe not age 18 quite yet, but certainly at some point early in their life that they feel that they're on their own. Because what happens is you become very focused on, on money and reality very quickly. And you don't feel that safety net, even though, of course, there's a safety net to, to go back home and live there. But that was never really an option for me. It never crossed my mind. It was just the ultimate failure, if that were to were to happen. And I'm trying to remember. So, so, so we, so basketball season starts. I wasn't practicing enough at all. I have a wife at home. Um, how do you really go and practice? You have no money. There was really no chance for me to be successful even though I was a good player, but a freshman in a new school and a very bad team, it was. No fans or anything. It was just kind of a, okay, that's the team. And, you know, I did my practice and I did my workouts and it was grueling and it was it was tough. And I went to the job once a week and we just tried to sort of make it. And then it was time for the tournament, the Thanksgiving time. We had a tournament up in, in Wyoming, and so I was going to have to leave my wife alone on, the, on our first Thanksgiving together in this situation. Now, we were fighting. You know, we were we were already fighting. Uh, she, just for an example, um, it was her birthday in September that, that year. So right away, within a month of being together, of living together. And I went, and there was this, there was some kind of a machine that would print a personalized card. Of course, I had another present as well, but um, of course, not extravagant. Um, but I also got this card, and I remember that the, I, I did a mis a misspelling um, in the in in the greeting that I that I printed, and I, and I printed it out and I paid for it, and I noticed oh gosh one letter's off, and I thought to myself, ah it's it's fine. <laughs> well, not not to Eva, because because we were I remember we were in the, we were in the car, and she was so mad at me for the misspelled card. I guess psychologically she felt that she had sacrificed everything to be with me, which she did. We, we just didn't see this coming. We didn't see this, this, this dynamic of our relationship coming where there was now resentment, real resentment. And she kicked the windshield from the inside of the car from the passenger seat and she cracked the windshield with her, with her shoe. And she threw the ring down and it went like under it, it was hard to reach and get to later it was a, a serious tantrum she loved her tantrums and the other piece of this is not just the fear of being together and all this and not just you know the anxiety we both had about life was that there was the sexual element that when we were dating when we were not married or together or living together um we it was always, I mean, I was 100% fulfilled. Everything was perfect. I had no other needs in the world for anybody else or anything else. But for some reason, as soon as I sort of felt trapped, like this woman forever from age 18, I was like starting to fantasize about other girls. And, you know, I, and and I just didn't know what to do. It was a strong, strong feeling. And I told her about it, kind of trying to fantasize about it during sex and things like that. And, and... It made her very, very, very jealous and angry because she felt that she had sacrificed everything, which she did. It didn't feel like an opportunity to live in America, even though she had dreamed of going to America from, you know, as a teenager, which is why she became an exchange student. This was not her, in her imagination, this situation of, of you know, having to think about money, having to babysit, and having a husband that is fantasizing about other girls. I treated her well. I loved her. I was attracted to her completely. But I think it was just in my, it was my sort of escape where I felt trapped also. What about my basketball? What about my life? You know? But back to the basketball and the tournament. So Thanksgiving is coming. We've all, we've already had all these problems just, you know, right away in our relation, in our marriage. And by the way, we got married at the courthouse. We got married right away after she turned 18 at the courthouse, just the two of us. Kind of hard to do. Um crazy and I had, I had to take the bus with the basketball team up to Wyoming which is obviously a long very long drive 
And Eva, was, we were talking to my parents, and she felt that she would rather go fly to Wisconsin to be with my family for Thanksgiving than to be alone for Thanksgiving. And I think they might have helped with that plane ticket, of course, but it was kind of the beginning of the end because now I'm going on a bus with a bunch of guys I don't even like um, to Montana in, in, in the snow for, for basketball. And I'm at a hotel where a bunch of girls are in the rooms and partying. And I was like, what am I doing? This is probably not going to work. And by the way, that and on the way back on the bus, I made up my mind that I'm going to quit basketball. Now, quitting basketball, I told you, I told you in the last in the in the talk one, what basketball meant to me. So for me, quitting basketball was like the whole point of my life, the whole point since seventh grade, since before seventh grade, was to get a scholarship to go to college and play college basketball. I played a couple games. And made up my mind to quit basketball. Why? Because I didn't, I wasn't making any money, and I and, and my expenses were there, food, rent, tuition, books, and I and I didn't make any real money. I, yeah, okay, the tuition, the scholarship would have maybe covered most of the tuition uh, the next year, but the tuition back then wasn't bad. It was like four thousand, five thousand per semester, which is completely low. No, it was less than that. It was it was it was it was lower than than what we're used to today for in-state tuition. So I come back from this trip and I tell my coach, I hand in my stuff, my uniform and everything. And I said, I'm quitting. He's like, he, he never could have possibly been more angry with anybody after he recruited me and wined and dined me to get me out there. And he wasn't a very nice person at all, but he basically threatened. He said, I'm going to destroy you. You're never going to set foot in this, in this, in this university. Well, he, it turns out it turns out he probably didn't have any power to do anything about that but they took you know I got my first semester paid for with it with a scholarship but that was it and I had to get a job and so I guess we were kind of relieved when 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 Eva came back from her for Thanksgiving um she was proud of me for I think making that sacrifice um because she had made the sacrifice of not going to medical school and not doing the things in Europe that she might have been able to do, but in the at the end of the day, I mean, that's not a very successful outcome for someone who who had, had worked so hard to get to that position. Um, you know, if I if I had gone, I could have easily had gone to to Europe and played basketball without going to college. I could have done that. I could have gone pro uh, at a you know a sm- at, in a smaller town or like a you know they have these leagues within these within Slovakia and other countries. And I could have easily played as a professional. So you get paid to play basketball. That would have been a really good option for me. But it never crossed my mind as an American to live in Europe. Um, that should have been what I did next, to be honest. But how can I say that? That my life wouldn't be what it, what it was, what it is. So life goes on. Now we're adults. And now I had to get a job. And I got a job as a telemarketer. I didn't realize it at, at first, but soon realized that it was kind of a scam. It was a total scam. We would call people, cold call people for four hours at, after, you know, in the evenings um, when they're either dinners, asking for money for search and rescue fundraiser for the, you know, in Colorado, the mountains, you have the helicopter rescue and all that. But of course, very little to nothing went to search and rescue. I found out later. So whatever we did manage to raise from people's goodwill was just taken by this boss in a small dingy rented office. And that's how I made six bucks an hour. And if we're lucky, um, you know, once in a while, I would, it was so miserable. I hated it so much doing the cold calling and bothering people. And, and I would even fake calls. I would talk without even dialing. <laughs> I would do crazy stuff and barely get any funds raised at all. I wasn't very good at it. And reading a script, it's just bad. It's so dark and depressing. And the best we would do for a date for date night was go to Super Saver Cinema. We'd go to Ponderosa Restaurant for a all you can eat buffet, and then go to Super Saver, which is older movies at a much lower price than the new movies, and that was our date night. But that even that was much better than anything else that than normal life would have been. You know, we couldn't drink. We're age eighteen in the U.S. You can't drink until you're twenty one, and we couldn't go anywhere, and and we were just together watching TV. Um, having our little couples fights, I suppose. Um, there were good times, you know. We went. I learned to ski. Um, 
I think we, we found some, the telemarketing eventually went away, but before that, before it did, I, in the sun, that next summer, we went back to Wisconsin for, the plan was to work at the, at the veterans home at like a senior old, old person's home and in the laundry, which was completely miserable. I worked, I get, had to get up at like three o'clock in the morning, two thirty or three o'clock in the morning and, and deal with soiled laundry. <laughs> and so did she, so did Eva. Can you imagine how, how strong our commitment was to our plan to be together and our, our love to be together. And that, you know, the challenges we face, I mean, that the outside world is going to ruin a perfectly good relationship. Uh, I suppose it wouldn't have been, you know, we were strong-willed people. I was very strong-willed. I, I had my goal. I wanted to finish. I wanted to graduate college, period. I wasn't giving up because I, I had felt from what I was taught in school and from my parents that if you don't get a degree, you're going to basically do hard, manual labor and make no money at all. So you have to get a degree, do whatever it takes. And it was just rough to be married in college. You know, I couldn't have any friends. One time I, one time I made this friend from Azerbaijan or from Georgia and we went home. For, I took him home for lunch to my apartment and my mom had basically decorated my apartment because, you know, I'm not going to buy furniture and, and, and stuff. But my mom would love, used to love to decorate. She, she had really silly, tacky, like country, like really different taste, let's say, from, it wasn't modern. And he was just laughing at my decorations in my apartment. And so, you know, friends, it just, they didn't understand why we're married. We're a weird married you know, couple, the only ones, obviously, you know, in university there. Um... So really rough times. We had to find a way to get back to Europe to visit our family once a year. We had to pay for that. Basically credit cards. At that time, you're offered credit cards. We had big credit card debt starting to rack up. Yeah, we we're making a little bit of money, but I didn't see I didn't see the way the way out. Um I guess I'll leave it at that for this talk. I'm, and and things change a little bit and kind of normalize going into year two and of college. And, you know, kind of what I did for a living and, and how things took off. Uh, but I, but that's kind of, I, that was a very important segment of my life from falling in love with Eva to that first year of marriage and, and all the issues. So to be continued.